Um, and secondly, I wanted to thank the organizers of this conference for both organizing the conference and for inviting me to it. The subject of my presentation is occasioned by the fact that a great many of the attacks, the what you can only call a deluge of attacks on the Baha'i faith that's been unleashed in the last few years by the Islamic Republic, the, one of the primary focuses of these attacks has been the accusation that certain members of the previous regime in um, the Pahlavi regime in Iran were um, Baha'is, their leading members, high, high government officials, cabinet ministers, and so on were Baha'is. And this um, accusation is something that has um, then linked to uh, a general attack on the Baha'is for having somehow been the cause of all the problems that Iran had or is uh, 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 accused, uh, the, the Pahlavi regime is accused of having caused. Uh, that somehow the Baha'is were responsible for all of the uh, corruption and abuses of human rights and so on that the, uh, occurred in that previous era. Um, and uh, this, uh, and then the, the, the second point that's very often made is that um, uh, these Baha'is, uh, that, that Baha'is claim to be not engaged in politics, that they, they uh, are not involved in politics, and yet these individuals, these high members of the Pahlavi regime, are then pointed to and say, well, these people are Baha'is, so this proves that the Baha'is are uh, lying, are false, and so forth. So this whole area of the involvement of the Baha'i faith in politics has become a, a, is a cause of misunderstanding, of confusion, not just to these gentlemen who are uh, obvious uh, uh, enemies of the Baha'i faith, but even to the friends of the Baha'i faith and sometimes even among Baha'is themselves. So the object of this uh, presentation is fourfold. Firstly, to um, look at the history of the Baha'i involvement in Iranian politics. Secondly, to look at the specific allegations of these uh, uh, cabinet ministers and high government officials in the Pahlavi era having been Baha'is. Thirdly, to look at this question of what, what do the Baha'is mean when they say they're not involved in politics and why. And fourthly, to look at what, what is it that the Baha'is are engaged in Okay, so quickly on to the first area. Um, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, first openly declared his mission in 1867 in Edirne in European Turkey. And really from that very first year in 1867 of his declaration of his mission, he was also writing, starting a series of open letters to uh, rulers and leaders of the world at that time discoursing on, on how to solve some of the problems of the world, and in particular, the question of peace. And uh, in 1875, he instructed his son, Abdul Baha, to write a treatise on the, uh, what reforms, how Iran should be reformed. And this was in direct response to the reforms that Moshir ad dawla had at that time been um, uh, undertaking in Iran. So it was, it was in, in a uh, response to that, to those re reforms. And o over the next, um, y over the ensuing years, the Baha'i leaders, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, were in contact with many of the leaders of the reform movement in Iran, uh, not only Moshir ad dawla himself, but people like Mirza Malkam Khan, Jamal ad-Din Asadabadi, uh, Mustashar ad dawla and others. And as we come closer to the time of the constitutional revolution, um, some of the leading constitutionalists, such as Haji Sheikh al-Rais, um, uh, the um, uh, leader of the constitutionalist forces, um, Nasr um, uh, al-Saltaneh, uh, uh, Asad al-Bakhtiari, um, Sardar Asad al-Bakhtiari, um, and, um, and in some towns the, the leading constitutionalists were Baha'is. Uh, I can cite the uh, example of Sari, for example, and some of the newspaper owners of the leading constitutionalist newspapers were Baha'is. However, when we um, come to the signing of the Constitution in 1906 and the ensuing, uh, the, the following months, 
what happened was that where the whole of the nation had been united in this constitutional movement, it fell apart and there was disunity and, and uh, dissension. And at this time, Abdu'l Baha, in uh, February 1907, Abdu'l Baha asked the Baha'is to withdraw from political involvement. And there are a number of reasons for this can be discerned from Abdu'l Baha's writings at the time. First of all, he said that he felt that the Baha reform movement might be held back by its association with the Baha'is. The reactionary forces, the reactionary clerics in particular, were saying that the Baha'i faith is merely a backdoor way. Uh, so, the, yes, the constitutional movement is merely a backdoor way for advancing the Baha'i faith. And, uh, of course, Abdul Baha's fears on this score were amply justified uh, over the next century where every Iranian, every Iranian statesman that has tried to introduce any reforms into Iranian society has been accused of being a Baha'i. Secondly, Abdul Baha was trying at that time to bring about a reconciliation between the Shah and the um, constitutionalists, and he may have felt that with the Baha'i so much on the side of the constitutionalists, this was hampering his, his attempts to bring about a, a reconciliation between the two sides. And the third dis reason we can discern for Abu Baha's writings is the fact that the Azali Babis were at this time telling the Shah that the Baha'is were supporters of the constitution, and there was a danger that the Shah would order a general massacre of the Baha'is, as was being urged on him by some of his supporters, such as Sheikh Fazlullah Nuri. However, um, so Abdul Baha asked the Baha'is to withdraw from political involvement, but after 1909 and the restoration of the constitution, again, there was a, a huge amount of national unity in bringing this about. And again, Abdul Baha asked the Baha'is, for example, to consider getting one of their members elected to parliament, one of the prominent Baha'is elected to parliament. But again, this was thwarted. The uh, clerics ensured that Baha'is couldn't be members of parliament by laying down certain bylaws. Um, and uh, again, the unity of the movement that had brought about the restoration of the constitution began to fracture. And so in about 1910, Abdul Baha again instructed the uh, Baha'is to withdraw from politics. And uh, really, that's remained the, the um, official position since that time. Shoghi Effendi, who took over the leadership of the Baha'i Faith in 1921, reconfirmed that uh, position and indeed introduced the, um, introduced the idea that, um, we, that, that um, there would be a, um, even sanctions for people who were involved in, in politics, that, that, that they would be uh, uh, administratively sanctioned within the Baha'i community. So that's, that's the situation as far as the political involvement of the Baha'is is concerned. So turning now to the accusations of these people who have um, been um, accused of be having been Baha'is in high positions in the Pahlavi regime, we can break, briefly divide these into four groups. The first group are those who have people who have no connection at all with the Baha'i faith. Uh, an example of this is Farrokh Ruparsa, who uh, was the uh, Minister of Education, the first woman to hold a cabinet post in Muhammad Reza Shah's government, and indeed also Mahnaz Afkhami, who held the post of Minister for Women. Second group of people who were accused of being Baha'is are people whose families were Baha'is, but who were never themselves at any time in their lives Baha'is. The most well-known example of this is, of course, Amir Abbas Hoveida. And uh, we're fortunate in having a whole book by Abbas Milani um, detailing the life of um, uh, Hoveida and uh, quite categorically showing that this was not the case. Um, I won't, so I'm not going to go into details about that. But another example of such a person is Parviz Sabati, who again, had, his family had some connections with the Baha'i faith, but he himself was never a Baha'i. The third group accused of being Baha'is are individuals who were indeed Baha'is and who either resigned from the Baha'i community or were deprived of their rights of participation in Baha'i community affairs when they took up a political post. And um, the most prominent example of this is Timsar Sani E, who for a time was Minister of War and later Agriculture Minister. And the fourth group accused of being Baha'is are people who were indeed Baha'is, but who, ha who didn't occupy any political post. Uh, they're included in these lists of accusations, but people like entrepreneurs like Habibullah Sabeta Pasal and Hojabra Yazdani, who were entrepreneurs who never held any political post, neither did Dr. Ayadi, who was the Shah's personal physician. 
by dragging in all these names, anti-Baha'i polemicists in the Islamic Republic attempt to make the Shah's cabinet and inner circle appear to be dominated by Baha'is. But in fact, most of these people were not Baha'is. Those who were Baha'is and took on a political post were deprived of their rights in, of participation in the Baha'i community. And a few of them were Baha'is but never held any political post. But what I want to do is to look at the lines of argument that are being used and the sort of evidence that's being presented for these claims. First of all, um, there are some where there is just simply no evidence at all. For example, when I look for evidence that Farah Huparsa was a Baha'i, the only evidence I can find that's cited is the fact that she once, on one occasion, attended a wedding where she was a relative of the bride and the bridegroom was a, from a Baha'i family. That's it. That's the only evidence they present for her being a Baha'i. The second problem with the lines of argument employed is that it assumes that the Baha'i community operates in the same manner as the Shi'i community. So, for example, when Hoveida says he's not a Baha'i, he's thought to be exercising tariyah, which is a, a legitimate in Shi'i Islam, but isn't considered legitimate in the Baha'i faith, and indeed people who engage in it are sanctioned in the Baha'i community. So we come down to the, uh, to, to the fact that either Hoveida was telling the truth when he said he wasn't a Baha'i, or he was exercising tariya, in which case he would have been sanctioned by the Baha'i authorities and expelled from the community anyway. So either way, he wasn't a Baha'i. Similarly, while in Islam it's assumed that anyone who's born into a Muslim family is a Muslim and there are even sanctions for, not because, to, to, for going to converting to another religion, uh, some of the accusations seem to assume that just because you were born into a Baha'i family, you must automatically be a Baha'i. But again, that's the way that Islam operates, but it's not the way the Baha'i community operates. People who grow up in, the, in a Baha'i family can leave the Baha'i community at any time in their lives if they want to, and there's no sanction against that uh, in, uh, applied. So uh, that's a, a, a third sort of problem area with the arguments. Um, but the m most obvious flaw in the argument is this, that, okay, even if we assume that these uh, people are right and these few individuals in Muhammad Reza Shah's um, cabinet were Baha'is, if they were Baha'is, then they would have been sanctioned by the Baha'i authorities. But what does it then say about all of the other people in Reza Shah's cabinet? What does it say about Shi'i Islam, that all of these other people in the cabinet were Shi'i Muslims, who were there with the uh, approval of, the, of their Shi'i authorities, religious authorities? If the Baha'i faith is going to be um, so severely condemned by, by people for having a, a few so-called Baha'is in, in the cabinet, what does it say about Shi'i Islam, that there were far a larger number of people uh, uh, who, were, who were Shi'i Muslims. Uh, there is a fifth argument as well, which is that uh, making a group response, collectively responsible for the misdeeds of one or few, uh, a small number of individuals is actually against international law. It's against the 1949 Geneva Conventions to which Iran is a signatory. And Iran regularly appeals to these signatories when it's protesting about what Israel is doing to Palestinians, uh, collective punishments for misdeeds of a few, and yet regularly does this for, uh, with the Baha'is. Okay, I want to go on now to the uh, Baha'i position on involvement in partisan politics. And uh, here it's useful to actually look at the dictionary definition of politics because there's two different meanings to the word politics. And um, th I think it's this, these two differences that have caused some of the confusion. The first meaning of politics concerns the forms, organization, and administration of a state a response to the need for human society to be organized in a manner that establishes justice and preserves order. This, of this aspect of politics depends upon the consensus of the general population. And this consensus involves the mutual consens consent of individuals to be bound by what we might call a social contract. This type of, this meaning of the word politics can perhaps be uh, designated by the expression political governance. And this type of uh, involvement in politics that Baha'is do engage in. Baha'is have a number of social principles such as equality of men and women, the elimination of all forms of discrimination, the right of all to education. Um, 
uh, the uh, elimination of extremes of poverty and wealth, the need for a global perspective on, and a global solution for social problems. These are all um, areas of discourse which the Baha'is do engage in, and for example, the Baha'i international community regularly participates in um, United Nations conferences on these sorts of issues and uh, submits position papers on these sorts of issues. This is the area of, uh, what you, as I say, political governance, this first meaning of the word politics. The second meaning of the word politics is the area of um, where, where uh, is the meaning that involves um, the acquisition or exercise of authority or power. Uh, these definitions I'm bringing from the Oxford English Dictionary. This aspect of politics involves partisanship, competition, and conflict. It often means that one faction um, oppresses or exploits another, and it often means the, uh, that people use their positions of power to remain in power. This second meaning of politics, which we can designate as partisan politics, is what Baha'is refrain from engaging in. And there are um, a number of aspects to the reason that Baha'is don't engage in this type of politics. Um, first of all, Baha'is believe that this type of politics is unlikely to solve the root, be, to solve the root cause of social problems. Baha'is consider that uh, the social, political, and economic problems that the world faces are at their root spiritual problems, and as long as existing political or economic theories address only material goals and utilize only material means, they're unlikely to tackle the root causes of our problems. And so therefore, that's one reason that Baha'is don't engage in this type of partisan politics. The second but more important reason, I think, is the fact that Baha'is have a particular vision of the sort of society that they think will lead to a realization of these social goals. And this vision involves the elimination of certain features that we currently take for granted and assume are an inherent part of the human social structure. In particular, Baha'is envisage a, a society where the present highly competitive social ethos is replaced by a more cooperative and consultative one. And they envisage a society in which the current hierarchical social structures, which necessitate that a small number of people are at the top of the pyramid, controlling the media and education system and making all the important decisions, while the majority are disempowered, discouraged from thinking for themselves, and are told what to think and what to do. This type of society, Baha'is believe, is, does not have a future for humanity. And Baha'is are b working towards building up communities in which no, no, person, no individuals have personal power, but rather all members of the community feel part of determining their own future. And um, the best way that uh, I can uh, sort of create a picture of this for you is to uh, talk about the difference between Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. Um, I think most of you in the room are familiar with the idea that Web 1.20 is websites where um, the information is presented to you uh, on a, uh, and the, the, the flow of information is one way from the web owner, website owner to yourselves, whereas Web 2.0 is where you, the reader participates in the, form, in the creation of the content of the website, and there's uh, information sharing. And this is the type of uh, politics that Baha'is believe is the politics of the future, and they are engaged in trying to build up this type of politics and not the politics 1.0, if you like, which is what the present political systems, the party politic, partisan politics, is engaged in. And it involves cooperation, it involves uh, consultative uh, methods, and so forth. And so, um, what, what are Baha'is actually doing to bring this about? Well, Baha'is are, are uh, engaged at the moment all around the world, even in Iran, despite all the uh, severe circumstances of the Baha'i community in Iran, in creating programs which, do, which precisely try to bring this about. They try to empower those people who are on the bottom rungs of society who have been used to, having, to being ignored, to being silenced, to being oppressed, to uh, start thinking for themselves, to start speaking for themselves, to engage in discourses, to perform acts of service, which in turn then enables them to uh, look at, the, uh, to, to examine and to come to ideas about the problems of the immediate society around them, and then to bring everyone, bring all these people who are engaged in this process together to consult about the problems of their localities, their neighborhoods, uh, 
and attempt to tackle these uh, and consult about what are the plans to tackle these problems. This is the uh, pattern which Baha'is are following at the moment. Uh, Baha'is are only right at the very early stages of this development of this pattern. But Baha'is believe that this is the answer, this is the way forward for humanity, this type of cooperative, consultative, locally based, uh, uh, consultative decision making, creating plans imp uh, to improve your society but within a global framework, understanding that you can't improve your locality without, uh, if it means detriment to other people. So uh, this is what Baha'is are actually actively engaged in, and they believe that this pathway has a much better hope and chance of uh, tackling the problems of society than that sort of hierarchical uh, uh, type of fr uh, framework within which the party political uh, stru uh, system works at the moment. So, Barry, then, four, the four points that I've tried to make are, one, that Baha'i uh, leaders did engage in uh, sort of discourse with the reformers of Iranian society up to about 1910, but that from that time onwards, they uh, asked the Baha'is to disengage from that. Secondly, that, therefore, uh, these accusations that these high government officials in the Pahlavi regime were Baha'is are false. Thirdly, that the, the Baha'is do engage in a discourse on, on political and social affairs uh, at the level of uh, principle, at the level of, of uh, uh, consultation, and they try to influence uh, international uh, organizations and even their own governments and localities, but they don't engage in this competitive partisan type of politics. And lastly, that Baha'is are currently engaged in trying to bring about uh, change at the local level through consultative, participative uh, methods that, in, that uh, bring everyone into the pattern, involve universal participation, as it were, and try to change society in that way. Thank you.